Morning, friends. Welcome to Grace at Home. We are grace for everyone, community for everyone, church for everyone, and happy Mother's Day. Today we honor the moms in our lives, those who have loved and cared for and poured into us, helped shape us into the people that we are today. Uh, so for those of you who had great moms and are celebrating the legacy they've passed on to you, we see you and, and we honor you today. Uh, to all the moms who are new moms over the last number of months, you're like in that fog of diapers and feedings and sleepless nights, we see you and we honor you. We want to celebrate moms today, to celebrate the joy and gratitude that rises in our hearts as we think of the moms in our lives that have been such a blessing. And we recognize that Mother's Day can be a little bit complicated. It sometimes comes with painful reminders as uh, not everyone has that story. Uh, there are mothers who have been estranged from their children or mothers who are no longer with us. Um, so Mother's Day can be a little complicated. And we want you to know that we see you too. Uh, to all those who wish they could be moms and longing for that pregnancy test to show two strips, uh, but that promise still feels like a long way off. We see you and we honor you today. For those who've lost their moms or lost their babies, we see and honor you today. For those who perhaps have not had children of your own, but have welcomed children into your life and poured into them like a mom or an aunt, we, we see you and we honor you today. As we think of those women in our lives who have shown us the goodness of motherhood in its myriad forms, we want to give thanks. We want to bless those women in our lives. May, may we see and honor those women that show us the heart of God, like, like mama bears with their cubs, like a mother hen with her chicks. They show us the heart of God. And so that's what we want to celebrate when we celebrate Mother's Day. This morning's message is going to continue in our um, series, Good News, Bad News, You Choose, but we wanted to just have a bit of a moment celebrating moms here off the top of our gathering online today. We're going to spend some time in worship now, sing a couple of songs, and then we'll head back into our series, Good News, Bad News, You Choose. We've only got two more messages left, so let's worship together.
face I'll see my pain no more my fear will cease I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King
Oh Lord, we're, we're so grateful for your goodness and grace this morning, that, you, that your love endures forever, that your mercies are new for us this morning. Uh, we, we come to you as people who want to know you and, and make you known, uh, that, that you would so move in our hearts and lives that we would be changed, that we would become more like Jesus as we spend time in your word, as we, as we pray, as we seek your kingdom. Would you have your way in us today? Would you reveal yourself to us today? Wherever we find ourselves, would you shine through us that we would see your kingdom come and your will being done on earth as it is in heaven? For, for we ask these mercies in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, like I said at the beginning of our, our gathering this morning, we are heading into our last couple of messages of the Good News, Bad News, You Choose series. It's been going on for quite a while as we've been walking through the Gospel of John, and next Sunday we'll wrap it all up. And I hope that you have found this slow walk through John to be meaningful and life-giving. I find that one of the best ways to engage with Scripture is to settle into a specific section and spend some time there, you know, rather than just, you know, jumping around from favorite verse to favorite verse or, you know, just touching on those, those stories that um, we really enjoy through Scripture. It, it's helpful to take a, a larger section and maybe spend a little more time, like to take an entire book of the Bible like we have with the Gospel of John and to commit to, like, slowly reading, you know, small chunks at a time. Um, for my own devotional life, I'm walking through the New Testament in the year uh, this year to really immerse myself in the text. John was a bit of a larger book to tackle with, you know, you know, barring a couple of seasons in the church calendar where we broke it up. It's, it's you know, almost two years walking through it. But for, for us to take a book like Philippians and spend a month in it in our own personal time, or Galatians, or James, like, reading them just verse by verse and letting Scripture seep into our heart and mind, I find it very helpful to approach Scripture uh, with that sort of perspective, focusing more on the quality time rather than quantity of what we get through, reading only a couple verses at a time. I remember once, uh, a number of years ago, I heard a Colombian preacher explain the way that he reads his Bible, and he says that he reads a passage over and over again until it's essentially mem memorized, until he's got, kind of got it internalized and, and could quote it um, back to you. And then he continues to read it daily until he feels like he can actually live that passage out, until it becomes a part of the way that he interacts with the world. And then he moves on to the next verse. Now, I think he may have been exaggerating a little bit, and there's probably a few passages in Scripture that you m probably don't want to uh, try and live out, dashing babies' heads on rocks and things like that. But um, but you get his point that it was, uh, for him, reading Scripture isn't just about, like, getting through as much of the Bible as you can, but it's, it's actually having that Word living in us and through us that we reflect the goodness of God to the world around us. So that when we face different situations, it's passages of Scripture that come to mind that would lead us and guide us. That's why I love taking uh, time working through books like the Gospel of John, that we see how God speaks to us and, and reminds us again of those stories of Jesus interacting with people as he was here on earth. And, and so this morning we're in the second to last chapter of John's gospel. We're in John chapter 20. Um, Jesus has risen. He's appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. She's run to tell the disciples that she has seen the Lord. And that's kind of where we, we left off. This, this first witness to the resurrection, Mary Magdalene, going back to the disciples and, and telling them that like she, she's seen the risen Savior. And so the story we come to today is Jesus now appearing to those disciples, them in their fear and their doubt, him coming to them and declaring peace be with you. So come with me to John chapter 20. We're going to pick up the story in verse 19. We read there, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. 
Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So far for now. Let's back up a little bit to the, to the last episode that we uh, tuned into with Good Friday and Easter. In, in the actual timeline of, of what's going on in the life of the disciples, we're just a few days past Good Friday. The last time most of the disciples had seen Jesus was at his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Many of them took off running from there and have been in hiding ever since. Some may have snuck into the crowd and witnessed his execution on that Good Friday, but as far as they know, Jesus is gone. He's died on a cross, a criminal executed by the state. They are now leaderless, they're hopeless, and they're in fear. And the disciples are not sure what happens next. They've been following Jesus, and now he's gone. And suddenly Mary bursts through the door of the place they've been gathering on that first Sunday morning and shares this great news. He is risen. I have seen the Lord, she says. And I can imagine their mixed reactions. Like I would guess that most of that um, conversation was Mary having to retell the story over and over again and, and give them the details and try and overcome some of their Um, disbelief. Like some of them might have been skeptical that she was just overcome with grief. Like maybe she's hysterical. Maybe she's seeing things. But that evening on the first day of the week, so that's Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, they're gathered behind locked doors out of fear. It says fear of the Jewish leaders, those who had arrested Jesus and called for his execution. They were scared that the, the ones who had called for their teacher's execution might come to take care of the rest of the problem. That They were going to wipe out the rest of his band of brothers. And so they were locked into this room in fear. And Jesus comes and stands among them and says to them, peace be with you. Now, Jesus always knows exactly what to say in the moment. It, like, he has the perfect words to match the energy in the room. I, I can imagine there being anything but peace in that room before Jesus stepped into it. This was a room that was filled with grief and fear. Their Lord, their, their rabbi had been murdered. The, the one they'd given the, the last three years of their life to, the one they had hoped would be the deliverer and savior of the Jewish people, is he's dead, he's buried, and they might be next. The, the fog of grief would still be thick around them and it would be mixed with the fear of their own death. Like, it would make for a very anxiety-ridden atmosphere. And, and I can only imagine a feeling of like, well, now what? You know, I've, I've given up being a fisherman or I've, I've given up being a tax collector and now my leader's gone. What, like, how am I paying the bills? Well, what's going to happen next? And then Mary comes bursting in saying that she's seen Jesus, that he's risen, that he's back. He's no longer dead. Is that even possible? I can imagine their minds just reeling with all sorts of questions, maybe remembering moments where he said like that he would rise again or that you wouldn't see him for a little while, but then you would see him again. I imagine it was an afternoon filled with questions and, and doubt and maybe a little bit of hope starting to rise up. But it's into this atmosphere, into this anxiety and uncertainty that Jesus comes to them. And he's standing right in front of them and he says, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He comes to them in their fear, and he brings peace and joy. Again, he says to them, peace be with you. And he commissions them. He breathes on them and empowers them through the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm I'm sending you to be 
my witnesses. So twice he pronounces this, peace be with you, peace upon you. And this is so like Jesus. When in our own fear and anxiety, he brings us peace. When, when, when they feel lost, he comes to them. When they're locked away in fear, he comes and liberates them. But the Bible says that not all of the disciples were present when Jesus makes that appearance. There was one in particular who missed out on that action, Thomas. And I can picture, you know, Thomas sneaking in the door with groceries or whatever other errand he was out running when he missed Jesus dropping by, and the rest of the disciples just like mobbing him at the door. Like, we've seen the Lord, Thomas, where were you? Like, I can picture him, you know, just barely getting in the door before there's these shouts of excitement. Like, you just missed him. Where were you? We've seen the Lord. I can't believe you weren't here for this. We've seen the Lord. He was just here. But Thomas, who may or may not have heard Mary's declaration earlier, we're not sure, he's definitely not convinced. Was this some sort of mass delusion? What are they talking about? What do you mean you've seen the Lord? Where is he? He's not here now. Like, had their grief and fear overcome their common sense? Like, what are they talking about? There's a reason why he's been dubbed Doubting Thomas. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas has some pretty clear stipulations about whether or not he can buy into this idea of a resurrected Jesus. He says, unless I see with my own eyes, like unless I can put my fingers where the nails were, I'm not going to believe. Thomas appears to be steadfast in his doubt. And there's a, there's a little detail there in the passage that kind of stopped me in my tracks this week. It says, a week later. A week later. Like, what was going on in the life of the disciples for that week from when Jesus appeared that first time, but Thomas wasn't there, to the time he appears again the following Sunday? Like, had they been trying to convince Thomas that entire time that Jesus had risen? Were they still in hiding? It does say that they were still behind locked doors. Had they begun to, like, slowly spread the good news? Jesus had commissioned them and breathe the Holy Spirit on them? What, what did that week look like? And what would that week have felt like for somebody like Thomas, who missed out on that appearance and hears these stories from Mary and the other disciples that they had seen the Lord? I, I imagine Thomas was stewing that entire week with wrestling with his doubt, with, with no sign of Jesus, until they gathered again in that same room behind locked doors, and Jesus appears again with his now famous catchphrase, peace be with you. And this time he goes straight to Thomas. He says, put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand in my side. Like, stop doubting and believe. And I love this little detail that the very thing that Thomas said he needed to believe, the this stipulation that he had of like, well, unless I get to do this, I'm not going to believe. Jesus knew and goes right to Thomas and says, here, put your hand here. Put your hand here. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus provides the evidence that Thomas needed. And he says, now that you've seen, you believe, but blessed are those who have not yet seen or haven't seen yet still believe. Like Thomas said, he needed to see with his own eyes. He needed to touch the nail marks. And when Jesus shows up, he encourages Thomas to do just that. See here, feel here. Jesus comes to Thomas in his doubt, and he brings that peace and joy. Thomas responds with, my Lord and my God. And this is just like Jesus coming to Thomas in his doubt. He came to the other disciples in their fear, in their anxiety, and, and he comes to Thomas in his doubt, and he brings that same peace and joy. John closes the section by saying that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, now, but that they haven't been recorded. But what has been recorded or what has been captured was in order that we might believe. He says, these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John's directing that to us, all those who would read his gospel, all those who would read the good news, that this story of the resurrected one, this story who comes of this one who comes to us in our fear and doubt is willing to meet us in our fear and doubt, that we might believe that he is the risen one. Jesus came 
to the disciples in their fear. They were locked behind closed doors. And he appeared to them and he says, peace be with you. And there was great joy. And he still does that for us today. He meets us in our fear. So whatever your fear, whether it's fear of the future, whether it's fear of sickness or death, fear of what others might think of you, Jesus meets us in our fears. He meets us in our anxiety and he declares that peace be with you. When we uh, read of him like walking on water and calming the storm, like th- that's what Jesus does when he comes into our lives. He speaks peace into that turmoil, speaks peace into those situations that seem like there shouldn't be any peace. So whatever our fear, whatever our anxiety, wherever our turmoil, Jesus comes to us and speaks peace. He meets us in our fears. And he meets us in our doubts. Like Thomas wasn't quickly convinced, but Jesus didn't write him off. He didn't just say, oh, well, you, you're hopeless. You're, you're never going to believe. He let him put his hands in the scars to see with his own eyes. And in, in my faith journey, I've seen Jesus do that over and over again. It's often been through my doubts that I've been drawn closer to Jesus. It, it, for me, it's in the questioning. It's, it's in the pursuit of something deeper, not just taking things at face value. But that's what's brought me closer to the person of Jesus, because Jesus meets me in those questions. He reveals himself when we seek and we dig and we, and even in our skepticism, when we continue to pursue. Even in our fear and doubt, Jesus is able to meet us, and he declares, peace be with you. And he brings with us, with it, that peace and joy that's so overwhelming at times. So wherever you're at, today, whether you feel like you're locked away behind closed doors or you feel like you're doubting the testimony of others, Jesus is able to meet you right in that, even in our fear and doubt. And when he does, the words that he proclaims are, peace be with you. Don't let this fear overcome you. Don't let this fear overwhelm you. Don't let this fear hold you back from pursuing faith. Don't let this doubt overwhelm you. Don't stop asking questions. Don't just give up, but keep pressing in, keep pursuing, keep seeking. And he says, peace be with you. And, and then the, the declaration of like, we have seen the Lord and my Lord and my God, the, the, the declaration of belief that comes when we recognize that he meets us even in our fear and doubt. He proclaims peace. And that peace passes all understanding. It's the peace that God brings to our anxiety, our turmoil, our, our fear, it, it's, it's almost impossible to explain. It, it kind of has to be experienced. Like Paul puts this piece th- this way in his letter to the Philippians. He, he encourages the people in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful picture of what the peace of God does for us. It transcends all understanding. We can't quite explain it, why we have peace when it seems like there shouldn't be any peace. Why, why we sense this Um, feeling that God God has got this, even though it feels like things are crumbling down around us. This peace that transcends all understanding guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It it, it reminds us that God is in control. It reminds us that Jesus is with us. He comes to us in our fear and doubt, proclaiming, peace be with you. And, And my prayer is that you would know that peace in the same way that the disciples did when they were gathered behind closed doors in their fear, Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. And there was much joy as they realized that Jesus had come to them in their fear. And when Thomas, a week later, sees Jesus and puts his hand in the scars and puts his hand into Jesus' side, declares, my Lord and my God, that he has stopped doubting and believed that Jesus comes to Thomas in his doubt. Even in our fear and doubt, Jesus comes to us and he proclaims peace. And that that peace that passes all understanding would be ours today, and that it would guard our hearts and minds, that whatever you're facing today, you would know that Jesus comes to you 
And he says, peace be with you. May that peace guard your heart and mind today, I pray. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are, we're so grateful that you do come to us. You come to us in our fear and doubt. You come to us in the midst of our storms, our turmoil, when we feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel, when we feel like there's no solid ground underneath our feet. You calm the waves. You, you calm the storm, even if it's just the storm inside of us, and you declare peace be with you. I'm so grateful that there's nowhere we can go to escape your presence. We've never wandered too far. You're always able to reach us. Would our hearts be filled with peace as we pursue you, as we seek you and, and know you, as we're changed by you? May we, like the disciples, declare with great joy that we've seen the Lord. Would we move from our fear and doubt into that peace and courage that causes us to share your goodness with the world around us? May we be filled in order that we could be spilled out for those who are thirsty among us, that we would be like a drink offering. Lord, would you use us to reveal yourself to others in their fear and doubt? Would we help reveal your goodness and grace that they may know your peace that passes all understanding and it would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? For we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. A couple of quick announcements before you go. We do have a couple of summer positions available. If you or someone you know would like to join our team for the summer, working with kids and youth, um, with things like Adventure Week and the camps down at Manhattan, um, we'd, love to, we'd love to hear from you. So applications can be submitted to either Pastor Cody or Pastor Shea. They need to be in by May 16th. So if you or someone you know is thinking about summer employment and would love to come and work here at the church, working with our kids and our youth, um, make sure you get your application in by May 16th. We're going to have a very short congregational meeting on May 29th um, for our members right after the service to ratify our appointed board. Uh, the meeting shouldn't take more than about 10 minutes, but uh, we'd like to have as many of our members present so that we can ensure that we have a quorum. It's just taking care of some of the leftover business from our uh, AGM, and this is just kind of a one-time uh, thing that we need to do uh, after um, moving from an elected to an appointed board. So that's going to be on May 29th after the service. We'd love for you to join us for that. And then June 4th, our annual men's golf tournament is happening in Carmen again. Um, this year, we're going to have the option to do just the nine holes like we have in the past, um, but we're also going to uh, open it up for 18 holes. So if you'd like to do a full 18, there's that option. If you'd like to just join for the back nine and only do nine, uh, you can hop on for the last part of our tournament together and then join us for lunch afterwards. Um, so there's a $5 prize fee that gets paid uh, to, to Greg, who's organizing that. Um, green fees, cart fees, all of that stuff get paid directly at the clubhouse. So to register or for more information, please email Greg Harrishaw. He's organizing that for our men's ministry. And that's our uh, annual men's golf tournament that's happening on June 4th. So again, we want to wish all the moms out there a happy Mother's Day. We hope you have a great weekend. And until we see you again, by God's amazing grace, we are the body of Christ. And because of that great grace, let us go into the world in peace and courage, holding to the good, honoring all of God's children, loving and serving the Lord by loving and serving our neighbor, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Peace to you.